All right, 1 Samuel chapter 21, we're going to be covering chapter 21 and 22 in this particular handout, and as I said, we're just scratching the surface of this new handout, and if you would look with me at chapter 21, and we'll begin reading in the very first verse there, down through about verse 6, and then pick up our comments. <clears throat> then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech. Nob is a location. It is uh, geography, and so you might give attention to Bible maps there and figure out where things are. He comes to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter, and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter on which I am sending you, and with which I have commissioned you. And I have directed the young men to a certain place. So David explains to Ahimelech the priest, this is why I am alone, because Ahimelech knew something was up. So what problem do we have in the first couple of verses of this chapter? Is David telling the truth? He is not. Even if you leave, in the previous chapter you have David and Jonathan meeting in a field, and Jonathan is helping David to escape, telling him, my father is indeed out to take your life and you need to get out of here. And then you go right to chapter 21 and David comes to Nob, to Ahimelech, apparently on the run, having left Jonathan, now he's with Ahimelech the priest. If that chronology holds true, David has no men with him. David is indeed alone and he's just flat out telling a lie. If chronology is confused in some way here, and it doesn't take place directly after leaving Jonathan, if there's something misplaced here, maybe he does have some men hiding out somewhere. Whatever it is, when he tells Ahimelech that the king has sent me on a mission, we know that's a lie. Saul was not sending him on any mission. Even if the chronology is confused, David is still lying. He's on the run from King Saul. He's been fearful of him for quite some time. So we have that taking place in the first couple of verses. Now, verse 3, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. Well, I, I don't know how big the loaves of bread are that Ahimelech has. We're going to find out this is the bread of the presence that would be in the tabernacle. And all you need to do is Go back to the book of Exodus, where that table of showbread is created. Look at the size of the table. It'll be given in most Bibles in cubits. Measure it out. And the loaves of bread are not going to be that big. So if David has an army of men with him, five loaves would hardly feed them. That something there doesn't make sense. So he's asking for five loaves of bread or whatever you have on hand. And the priest answered David and said, There's no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out, and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary journey. How much more than today? will their vessels be holy? So we set out before, and their vessels, their bodies were holy, having been kept from women from that kind of activity. How much more today? We're on this special mission from the king. Well, he's not. But he's just continuing the deceit. He's continuing that process. He's expanding on the lie he's already told. So he tells the priest, of course their vessels are holy. They've been kept from women, and uh, so we can have that bread. So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. <clears throat> so that's the case that we have here. The bread of the presence... I'd like to take a pause, if you keep a marker in 1 Samuel 21, 
Let's move back to a discussion in Leviticus chapter 24, please. Leviticus chapter 24. I'm going to begin reading here in verse 5. Then you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. You shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the Lord's offering by fire, his portion forever. In Exodus 25 verse 30 we'll add this. You shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. So that reading in Leviticus, who's supposed to eat that bread? Who's it for? The priest. Aaron and his sons. That's who it's for. Does it say anybody else is supposed to eat that? It's consecrated bread. It's holy bread. It's for Aaron and his sons. It's for the priest. Where were they supposed to eat it? In a holy place. So David is taking bread that is intended and authorized only for the priesthood. He's going to eat it some other place than a holy place as it was prescribed. In Mount Sinai, in, at, at that scene at Mount Sinai, I want to bring something up that's going to sound strange at first in our discussion, but I want to tie it in with something. I just want you to be thinking, as all of this develops from 1 Samuel into 2 Samuel, I want you to be thinking about this. Exodus 19, verse 15. <clears throat> he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near women. They're at Mount Sinai, they're coming to that mountain, he's going to be having a discourse with God, and he said to the people, to the nation of Israel, be ready for the third day, he's going to be ascending the mountain, be ready, do not go near a woman. One of the stipulations for going near holy things is to keep oneself from sexual relations. One is separating self from all common things. The Lord is that holy. That we're going to forego anything of a common kind, separate ourselves uniquely to God, and part of being holy and coming before the Lord is this. Notice that David, back in our text, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 5, David had an understanding about military men. David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out. When the army was setting out, when they were going out on a journey, they're going on behalf of the Lord, they're going on a mission for God, they kept themselves from women. They were uniquely separated to the holy God on His purpose. Deuteronomy 23, verse 9, When you go out as an army against your enemies, you shall keep yourself from every evil thing, every unclean thing. And sexual relationships seem to be part of that, the holiness factor of God. Now, <clears throat> with your marker still in 1 Samuel 21, I'd like you to jump ahead with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm just giving you something to think about for the future in our studies. 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning in verse 8 down through 13. Then David said to Uriah, who's Uriah? That's the husband of Bathsheba. He is a soldier. 
He's been out with the army. He's been in a battle. David calls him back. Why does David call him back? David has committed adultery with his wife. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, is now with child. David has a hope that by calling Uriah back to the holy city, by calling Uriah out of the battle as if he's going to give a report to the king, how are things going? He's using Uriah as a messenger to come in from the battlefield and tell him how everything is on the battlefield. How's it all going? So David said to Uriah, okay, you know, you've delivered your message. Go down to your house and wash your feet. So in other words, go see your wife Bathsheba. Go spend the night at home with your wife. And by doing that, David is going to cover his tracks. Then no one will know, is this David's child or is it Uriah's child? Nobody will be the wiser. And he'll hide the deceit, he'll hide the sin, hide the adultery. That's what he's trying to get Uriah to do. Uriah went out of the king's house and a present from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord, and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, <coughs> excuse me, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. My Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Well, David tried to get him to go back to his house again. It didn't work. What I'm seeing here is David understands when the military is going out on a journey, they're going on a campaign, they're going out in the name of the Lord, they kept themselves from sexual relations. <coughs> Uriah is sent back from the battlefield momentarily to give a report about the battlefield. Then he's going back to the battle lines. And he's not about to go down to his house He's considering what the rest of the army's doing. He is one in mind with them. And he's going to keep himself from that kind of relationship. It's not appropriate at that time. David, who understands all of that, tries to tempt him to go home and be with his wife and violate what he understands should be. When you put 1 Samuel 21, and what David knows about that, what he tells Ahimelech about that, and then what he tries to get Uriah to do later to cover David's own sin. Doesn't that become heinous? Doesn't that just, it doesn't that just, it sounds awful, doesn't it? I mean, we knew David did something horrible there, and he paid a big price for that in his later life, but to understand something like that, then to try to tempt Uriah into doing something that's going to violate Uriah's conscience as a soldier and do counter to what David knows is right there, then it just adds to that. And if you've never thought about that before, I'd like you to be thinking about that as that whole scene's going to unfold when we get into 2 Samuel. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's keep reading from there, keep looking at what we're doing. And uh, we're going to, we fast forwarded now to 2 Samuel 11 to see how that plays out with Uriah. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to me that Ahimelech is so concerned about the men being kept from a relationship with women. They can't have the bread if their vessels aren't holy. He's willing to enforce that, but as far as the consecrated bread that's meant only for the priesthood, he's willing to violate that. Inconsistencies are glaring to people who look in on us. 
if we are inconsistent with our profession of faith, if we hold this, but we don't hold that, that's glaring to people who look at that. We look at this history of David. We see what's playing out here. We see David being consistent in this way, inconsistent in that way. Ahimelech the same way. And those inconsist inconsistencies, as other people look at us today, if our faith is inconsistent, they see that. That sticks out like a sore thumb. We need to think about things that are inconsistent in terms of our faith. What do we hold as important and stick to, and we won't violate that for anything, but in this other area because it's convenient, because of a circumstance or a situation, or my wants or desires, I'm willing to violate this thing. Do we think neighbors and co-workers and family members don't see that? Do we think children don't see that? Do we think... We, sometimes we don't give our children credit. They spot stuff like that. And later in life, if mom and dad are inconsistent in their faith, they'll spot that and they'll say, okay, I know the way it really was. And that may encourage them to wander further from the faith because it wasn't all that important, only in the things they wanted but these other things they violated. So then why can't I violate what I want to? What does it matter? Those things make a mark on our children and on those that we would hope one day to convert. They see that stuff just the way we see it in the text that we're reading today. Do you have other comments or thoughts before we move forward? That's a big thing that I want us to have as a marker today is about being consistent in our profession of faith. Now, here's another point of observation. <clears throat> this event comes up in the New Testament pages. You'll find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I'm going to be reading from Mark's account, or Matthew's account, rather, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and to eat. What did the Pharisees have to say about that? It's on the Sabbath day. They're going through the grain fields, and as the disciples of Jesus go through, they just reach out their hand, and they grab some grain, and they, and they begin to eat it. What did they say they were doing? They're, they're breaking the law in what way? They're working. They're harvesting. They're harvesting on the Sabbath day. They're reaching out, grabbing that grain, and, then, and they're eating it. So they're harvesting. They're working the field. And that's, I mean, it's silly. And what they're doing is they're breaking the rules that the Pharisees and scribes have set up. These are man-made rules. These, these go way beyond what the Old Testament law taught about it. And so that's what they're saying. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he, Jesus, he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions? How he entered the house of God? Tabernacle at Nob with Ahimelech. And they ate... They ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone. So Jesus validates what we have just said in class. That was consecrated bread for the priests alone. Nobody else was supposed to eat that. And Jesus even plays along with the deceit of David. His companions are with him. They're hiding out somewhere, and, uh, and so he plays along. And anybody who knew the Old Testament law, anybody who knew the Old Testament scriptures, knew the deceit that David was playing that day. They would have known the truth of that. Guess what the Pharisees didn't do? They didn't correct Jesus and say, well, no, he, he, didn't, he didn't have any companions with him. He was on the run by himself. 
They didn't correct that. They would have to admit David not only took bread that didn't belong to him, he's also a liar. And David was their hero. And that's why Jesus brings up David. They will laud and magnify David. They'll sing his praises. And Jesus points out he did what was unlawful, and nobody wanted to correct that, well, he didn't even have anybody with him. He was lying on top of everything else. So he brings this up, and they were complaining to Jesus about his disciples, and he illustrates their biased opinion by bringing up this Old Testament hero, David, and pointing out his sin. And apparently he didn't even have any companions with him, and the whole thing was a lie. So the bread of the presence, verse 6, the priest gives him this, and uh, by the way, bread of the presence, the idea is God is always watching, and we are always in His presence. We are always in the presence of the Holy One. That was the bread of the presence. One loaf for each tribe, for each tribe that was there, 12 tribes, and they were there in the tabernacle setting, on the table of showbread, in that symbol. They were always in the presence of God. And it renewed with fresh bread. It was continual. It was, it was ongoing. They were never out of the view of God, the presence of God. His face was always turned toward them. So what sort of people ought we to be understanding that? That is the message of the bread of the presence. You shall be holy, for I am holy, is the idea behind that. Other comments there before we go to verse 7 through 9? All right, we're going to run into another player. His name is Doeg. Verse 7, now, one of the servants of Saul <clears throat> was there that day, detained before the Lord. So there must have been some matter that Doeg was on, detained before the Lord, would indicate that uh, maybe he is unclean in some way, something ceremonial going on, a vow, something of that nature, and he's detained before the Lord. We're not told exactly what that is. And his name was Doeg the Edomite. If he's an Edomite, who's he descended from? Esau's right. He would be descended from Esau. And they were not particularly friendly to the Israelites. There was some animosity there between Edomites and Israelites. And so it says that he's the chief of Saul's shepherds. So we see him playing a very different role, more like a soldier. David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Then the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there's no other except it here. And David said, there's none like it. Give it to me. So we're told as a sidebar right now, Doeg the Edomite's there. He's at Nob. He's eavesdropping. He's hearing what's going on between David and Ahimelech. He knows they're having a meeting and that Ahimelech's helping David out with food and with a weapon. So right now we're just told he's there. We're not told what he's going to do with that. That'll unfold in, in uh, later passages that we're going to be reading. But there's a lot more to Doeg than first meets the eye. He's actually going to become an informer. He's going to go back to King Saul. He's faithful to him. And he's going to tell him about David. I found out where he's at. Saul's looking for him, wants to kill him. And Doeg says, I found him. I know where he's at. And so he's going to inform, and eventually he's going to play the role of an executioner. And we'll see that uh, in, a, in a while. So uh, <clears throat> Saul is told that uh, these events have transpired at the place of Nob. Now we come to verses 10 through 15. Then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of, king of Gath. So king of Gath, what nationality? Philistine. 
He is a Philistine king. They have five major city-states. Gath is one of those. That's the one where Goliath was from. He was from Gath. So they know all about that. They can remember it well. And David, of all places to go, decides he's going to look for refuge among the Philistines in the city of Gath, where Goliath came from, and he's going to try to hide out there. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Someone asked before, did, did Saul actually know David was going to be the next king? Well, the Philistines knew it. It seems like at this point it's common knowledge. And uh, everybody's got this figured out. Did they not sing of this one as they danced? saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And of the ten thousands that David had slain, many of them would be Philistines. So they're saying to Achish, look, Achish, before you accept this guy in your city here, remember who he is. Remember what he's done. Remember how they sang about him. Remember who he's killed of our people. And so they start talking that way. <coughs> Verse 12, David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? And so David's going to get booted out of Gath. They're not even going to touch him. Just get him out of here. So whether this is all in exact chronological order or not is up for debate. We know that David before had picked up the sword of Goliath, but I doubt very much that he brought the sword of Goliath into Gath. That'd be rather obvious. The armor and the armament of Goliath was spectacular and unique to the giant. We have a record of his spear and the head of his spear, and his shield, and his armor. All of that was designed for Goliath. And they would have recognized that. They would have known whose that was. So David, if this is in some kind of chronological order, would have stashed that somewhere. Very doubtful that he would have brought it into Gath. We're not told one way or the other, but it just seems doubtful that he would do that. <coughs> So, uh, so this is now the hometown of the deceased Goliath. And um, if David did travel there directly from Nob, then Nob to Gath is about 25 miles away to the southwest. If you look on your map, you'll be able to kind of see the distance and direction there. And he gets a, a reception there that at first seems good by the king himself, but then his people begin to talk to him about that. It's interesting that later in time, David's going back to Gath, and he's going to go with 600 men, and he's actually going to be received and welcomed at that time. So David goes back there again later with 600 men, and that's up in chapter 27 that we'll be reading about that. The servants of Gath uh, declare their suspicion of David, and they warn the king about him, and uh, they know he's, he's the ruler of the land, verse 11. And they remember the song and all the things that go with it. And so David is going to get out of there by playing insane. He's going to act like he's nuts, like he's not in his right mind, like something happened to him. And uh, he disguised himself in his general appearance. He just made himself appear as though he was insane, not in his right mind. What else did he do? General appearance, scribbling on the door of the gates. He's just 
nonsensical stuff that doesn't make any sense at all, scribbling on the doors of the gate, and then the saliva running down the beard and, uh, and the drooling thing. Um, I thought about this, <clears throat> that if you're trying to avoid any kind of accountability and responsibility, maybe sometime I'll try this at home, see what it gets me out of. But uh, I don't think it would work. Here's something I do want us to think about of a more serious nature. Do we ever try to escape responsibility by acting less capable than we are? Are we ever approached with something of responsibility and accountability? And we try to put off the appearance that we are less capable than we really are. I'm not the one to serve in this capacity. I'm not the one to serve in that capacity. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. Do we ever try to escape things by looking like and acting like we don't know what we're doing and we can't do it? Therefore, go to the next person and let them do it. You'll find some things like that when <clears throat> Jeremiah said, I'm too young. When Moses said, I'm not eloquent of speech. And you'll find others along that line of reasoning in the Bible where they're trying to get out of something they're being called upon to do. David escaped by acting this way. Do we ever escape responsibility by acting like we just, we just don't know what we're doing with that? We just we couldn't possibly. And people believe, well, they're just, not, they're just not capable. I guess they just don't have the intelligence and know-how to be able to do that, so we better look for somebody else. Think about that, because David was putting on a show. And sometimes we have to admit to ourselves, it's more our nervousness. The idea that we're going to be doing something we haven't done before. And rather than present something that's really kind of untrue. Let's be more honest with ourselves and say, I might be capable, I might be able, and I'll never know until I take the challenge and do it. And then just try. So that's a far application of that, I suppose, but maybe something to think about. Chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. If you have your maps with you, you can find that. And uh, when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Here's something I wanted to have us think about. When his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went to the cave of Adullam to be with David. Where are his brothers? Where are his three older brothers? They're in the army of Saul. They were there on the battlefield at the valley of Elah when the Philistines sent out Goliath to challenge them for 40 days. His three older brothers were there in the army of Saul. If David's brothers and all of his family's household ended up going to the cave of Adullam to be there with David, that may suggest that his older brothers deserted the army of Saul, no longer felt safe there. Saul put two and two together. These are the brothers of David. Maybe they're no longer safe there and included in the group of his family and brothers who go to him at the cave of Adullam. Interesting switch that would take place there, if that's so. It does not call them by name, but it does say that his brothers and all his father's household heard of it and gathered to him there in that cave. If you've never thought about that, you might jot that down to think about.
of David giving protection. Brothers wanting to be there and help protect David. Okay, could be. It's time to draw the family together. We've got a problem, we're going to handle it. It could be they're not safe in the army of Saul. It could be a number of things. They're not called by name, but it gives us food for thought to think about what's happening in that cave as they're gathering there. Verse 2, everyone who was, these are the ones who gather to David. Everyone who is in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Then he left them with the king of Moab and stayed with him all the time. They stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. The prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. So Adullam, the cave, is synonymous with this stronghold. David's there. He's got 400 men gathered to him. This is not the elite of the elite. These are misfits of the land in some way. His parents are in Moab in the care of the king. <coughs> and David is continuing to hide out. <coughs> I would think about these who come to David, and they're in three categories. Distress. That word, the Hebrew word for distress, is used more often in the book of Job than any other Old Testament book. Think about the book of Job and what's going on, and you get the idea of those in distress. And those in debt, category number two. If you're in debt, perhaps your land has been sold. Maybe even family members into servitude to pay off a debt or fear of that happening. So those who are in distress... Those who are in debt maybe have nothing left and are running from that debt. And those who are discontented, and the word discontented is akin to the word bitterness. You might remember the Israelites traveling in the wilderness and they come upon a place of bitter waters and they name it Mara. That term Mara is akin to this term for discontented. Bitterness. Those who are in bitterness, those who are in distress, those who are in debt, these are the ones who gather to David in the cave of Adullam. And then he takes his parents to Moab. <clears throat> we will expand on that and the reason why next week when we come back to class. You might investigate the background there of Moab, see what you discover, go ahead and use your class notes that I've given to you, and you'll understand exactly why David would have taken them there. It makes sense. And so we'll come back next week, and we'll begin to look at that, make sure we're all on the same page with it. Go back to the stronghold and talk about that some more before we move on in chapter 22.